wonderful I think she does an amazing job isn't it so Eunice you're doing a fantastic job I'll tell you what I would love you to do I'd love you to stand um, we you know sometimes you sit and uh, you hear a lot and uh, and you feel a little bit sleepy and uh, you kind of shake it off you know the best way is to say hi to someone next to you and just greet them because you rocked up maybe and you weren't able to greet someone next to you why don't we do that very quickly? All right, can we all be seated now? <laughs> I think it's important to do that considering that it's been a long time since we last saw one another. Hi, Bruce and Sharon. It's so good to see you here. So lovely to see you guys. Hope you're well. Are you good? So good to see you. Um, it's been a long time. You know that. Why is that? Because last week, um, uh, last Sunday, we were not able to meet because there was a storm, as we just had in Dubai, you know, and uh, we were able to listen to the preach online, but goodness, Chris preached a storm as well, and which was fantastic. It was so good, and uh, so lovely to have everyone, and the week before that, I was away as well because I've been greeted by a lot of people here saying, it's been a long time since we last saw you. And, uh, and the guilt is kind of going deeper and deeper and deeper. No, I'm kidding. But it's so lovely to see us. If you go to your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Samuel, the second Samuel and chapter 5. And that's where we're going. Second Samuel chapter 5. Remember, we are still in this story. We are looking at David, the life of David. That's where you are in case you were here for the first time. And you're kind of wondering what we are doing. We're in the story of David. We're looking at this man, David, uh, today. And where we are right now in 2 Samuel, by the way, let me just help you, chapter 5, is that, um, that before this, as we have heard the this, this story, if you've read it or you've been through this preaching series, you'll know that David was somewhere tendering his father's uh, sheep, and, uh, and Samuel came to look for the next king to anoint and uh, he looked at all David's brothers and thought at least one of them would be, you know, the next king. But it turned out God had a different plan. And God's plan was for David to become king. And he was anointed. And, uh, and then you fast forward it. David finds himself in, in, in the king's palace. And he's the one who's worshipping in the king's palace and leading the king to the worship of the, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And you fast forward that, and he's fighting a battle with uh, this great giant from the Philistine army, a man called Goliath. And, and then after that, in the court of the king, in the palace, the king wants to kill him because he's jealous. And he literally pinned him to the wall, and he wants to kill him. But God um, is amazing, isn't he? He is there to protect us in every circumstance, in every place. And uh, David is able to flee, and eventually David ends up living in a cave somewhere. Um, like many of us who are living in a cave at the moment, you're living in this place of isolation, almost like a hermit, where you are on your own and isolated. In the prayer meeting this morning, and Taiwo brought a word and said, I feel like there are a lot of people here at Citygate. You, although you are in the crowd like this, with all the noise and everything that's happening, you know in your life you are isolated, you are somewhere on your own. And I believe God wants to say, like he said to, to David, the Lord is my shepherd. He is your shepherd, and he wants to bring you out. He wants to lead you into pastures that are green because he's the one who leads you beside still waters today. So I just want to say the church is a place where loneliness should never exist because the church is a family. We know that that's what God has done. He's brought us together so that we might be a family, so that he draws us from the fringe and brings us to the center so that we belong to this family of God. Amen? And if you are here today and you're struggling, you say, you don't know about where I'm, where, what I'm going through right now. Whether it's mentally, emotionally, as we heard earlier from Elizabeth, or otherwise, we just want to say we want to be there for you. 
And we want you to experience God through us because the church is God's, um, you know, people on earth just dis- 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 displaying the beauty of God by loving and caring for one another. Do not be alone. Do not be isolated. And uh, David is in the cave, and for a while he's in the cave. And while he's in the cave, um, God seems to be bringing people to him. And you'll think that God brings people to him who are sorted, but actually they're sort of like him. Uh, all of them are indebted, discont- in debt and discontented, and they are disillusioned. They are, they are a mess. You do realize we were a mess. Before we came to Jesus, I was a mess. And by the way, daily, as we heard, God sorts us out in our mess. And our mess, come, we need to bring our mess to him and not away from him. And these guys come and the Lord strengthens them and he, he reveals himself to them. And they go from a cave to this mighty, great army. They're called David's mighty men. And, uh, and we are told in, uh, in First Chronicles uh, chapter 11 that David had the, th- the, the three and then he had the 30, so David is gathering an army, and this man who's coming out of the cave, God wants to bring you out of the cave to conquer in this world, okay? We are called to be modern conquerors. Come out of your cave. And uh, he's got three who are mighty, and he's got 30 who are also mighty, and that's the 33, and then God puts the 47, uh, what number is that? 80, so he, he has a season of the 80, and then he goes from the season of the 80 men that he's gathering to defeat armies. And he goes from that and he gathers three tribes. Tribes just rock up and say to David, David, we want to give ourselves to you. The first tribe that arrives are the Benjamites. Who are the Benjamites? It's the same tribe of Saul. Saul has lost his way and the Benjamites are like, we know who the true king is. And they gather before David. And that's the first tribe. And the second tribe are the, the, tri- the tribe of Gad, the Gadites. And they say, we want to give ourselves to you, David. And then the third tribe are the tribe of Judah, and which is the tribe of David. But we know there's another king who came from the tribe of Judah. Do you know his name? Amen. Amen. That's Jesus. And now there are three tribes, mighty men, stage one, and tribes, three tribes, stage two, and then where we are now, and we're going to read this, is stage three, and uh, which is all the tribes of Israel suddenly rock up. Everyone, all the 12 tribes. And they say, David, we want to give ourselves to you. You become our king today, and we go into win battles and establish the kingdom of God on this place because God is with you. Amen? Remember stage one is the mighty men. Stage two, uh, or phase two, is the three tribes. And phase, and phase three is all of Israel now. For the first time, Israel comes together and they become this great, mighty people of God. And that's where we are reading now. Amen? So let's read Second Samuel chapter 5. That was a bit of background. It says here, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and sat... Behold, we are your flesh and blood. Some translations say we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you, David, who led us out on a military campaign. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. He knew how to be shepherded himself, and he becomes this great shepherd. And you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel And Judah 33 years. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. 
And David said on that day, whoever will strike the Jebusite, let him get up the water shaft to, to, to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore, it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it, called it the city of David. And David built the city around the miller inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for our great David. The Lord, when we are lost, when we were without hope, without God in the world, you send us the great David, Jesus Christ. And he's the one who's been leading us all along. And we just want to say thank you for Jesus today. We pray today that Jesus, you'll be revealed in this place. Even as we've been singing, holy are you, Lord, and creation, angels, all crowds, all of the earth singing, you are holy. We want to declare today that you, God, rule over our lives. You are our king. You are our Lord. You are our savior. You are our God. We want to worship you today. We pray, Lord, win battles over our lives. We trust you. and We believe, Lord, even as uh, we are about to hear this sermon, I pray, Lord, that in this place, would you begin to move right now? Would you begin, as we heard earlier, about secrets and, and uh, battles that we are fighting? Begin, Lord, to win battles by the Spirit right now in us. Lord, move from aisle to aisle and touch us. Lord, open our hearts and let the glory of God be revealed in everything we do. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go almost verse by verse and just unpack this story for you, if that's okay. So here we go. We looked at the three phases, and that's where we are now. People of God are coming together before David says, right at the beginning, he says, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. All the tribes. For the first time, all the tribes are with David. Previously, the tribes were not together. Some of them, three were there, nine were there. But now, all the tribes are coming before David. Let me tell you this. There's one who is gathering all tribes to himself one day. I don't know if you know that. And we were separated from God. You know the story? We were far away. You were in your tribe. You had your people, your tribe somewhere. Whether in your country or where you lived, you had your tribe. And we lived separated far away. And Ephesians 2 tells us that he himself, who's that? Jesus is our peace, who has made the two one and in his flesh has abolished the dividing wall of hostility that has separated us. Which means every tribe had a dividing wall of hostility that has separated us. So we were separated and the enemy lied to us and said, you speak a different language or different languages here in this place. You don't belong together. You come from different countries. You don't belong together. You have different career paths. You don't belong together. You, 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 you look different. You don't belong together. And so the lie goes until Jesus comes. And through his blood, he went and purchased a people from every tribe and tongue. And he went out. He preached peace to those who were far and pre peace to those who were near. And brought them together to belong to this new tribe. God's new tribe, the church of the living God. All tribes gather before the throne of God. All tribes are to gather before Jesus Christ. Do you know that? And this is what he says, the Bible says, John says about all the tribes. He says, after this I looked, and behold, this is Revelation 7, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people. What happened? These people were separated. These people had a dividing wall between them. The world had told them that 
we don't belong together. But through the finished work of Jesus Christ, all tribes are brought together to belong to the banner. And which banner is that? Jesus Christ. So today, in this place, we can lift one banner. And which banner is that? And say, we belong together because Jesus has brought us together. All tribes gather under our David, who is Jesus. He's brought us together. And by the way, we're just going to go out of here. And something else is going to be said. That's going to make you feel like, yeah, but those, those people are different. I don't belong there. One of the things I love about this church is the multicultural nature that we have here. From so many different languages, sorry, different backgrounds, languages, and all that. And I believe this is what God is building. Just look around you, turn around and look around you and see what all tribes look like. This is the church. This is the future. This is what God is doing around the world, gathering all tribes to his son. And he's going to do it through us as well. I mean, it was amazing when we did our national day, wasn't it, that we looked around and Pete was counting and he did a phenomenal job. I don't know how he was able to do that. Liz, do you know how he was able to do that? He came to me and said, you know what, we've got about 67 different nationalities in, no, 64, 64 different, and I'm living with this number. I was like, wow, thank you, Lord, and stuff. And then on the day of the national, you, you know, the, 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 the Nations Day, yeah, thank you, uh, I, I, I suddenly make it, I come here and says, did you know we've got 64? And Pete says, no, 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 we haven't got 64, we have got 67. I was like, he's been counting, going around, and hey, let me tell you this, he's good, he's good, he's still doing it, and it's probably over 80 now, but um, <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> and I, and I, I learned so much from that experience, actually. I learned to appreciate what God is doing in building all tribes together. And by the way, God is doing that more and more. Isn't it amazing what he's doing here? And uh, by the way, let's long for more. How many more tribes? How many more people, groups do we want to see here? Can we just, let's just, yeah, let's just, let's just call out nations that we want to see in our midst. Can we just do that? Just shout out. Saudi. Saudi. Yeah, great. Just watch the recording there. Good. <laughs> Come on, just let's shout out. Come on, this is a faith statement. Sorry? France. That's just amazing. I met Cynthia here earlier. It's Cynthia's first time here. And I'll talk to her and she's like, yeah, I'm from France. <laughs> Come on, Cynthia. Thank you. All tribes. Some French and uh, other nations. Come on, let's, let's call them out. Ghana. Oh, we've got loads. All tribes, come on, let's, let's call it on. Yeah, I don't want to hear Uganda here. <laughs> America, great. What else? Swaziland, come on, let's just shout out. Germany, China, Malaysia. This is a moment, this is a moment where we see how patriotic you guys lot are. <laughs> but let me say this, I'm a patriot to Jesus. Um, one day, all of us are going to be together. The church is going to last, and there's going to be people from all tribes coming before Jesus. Let me say this, let's not allow the world to divide us. We are together because Christ has fulfilled it and accomplished it on the cross. We belong together. So they said, he gathered all tribes. And then they say, they say to David, we are your own flesh and blood. Wow, what a statement. Okay, you could have said, yeah, I think the, the, Judah, the, the Judahites are my blood, my flesh and blood, but you guys are different. But actually, they, they, that's a profound statement. David, we are your flesh and blood. Why are they saying that? <laughs> we also have our David, and we are flesh and blood with him. Do you know who that is? Jesus. What happened was, you had your own tribe, your own people, your own nationality, your own everything. And we have the, 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 the bloodline of your nation or what, your, your people group until... 
you made that public declaration that you are following Jesus in your life as your Lord and Savior. And you know what? On the cross, the blood that was spilled wasn't just spilled for God to see, although the blood was for God to see. And that's why we speak of the Passover and the, the wrath of God passed over us because we are covered in the blood of Christ. Amen? But what happened is that we, from that moment, when we became one tribe, God's new tribe, the blood that flows through my vein is the blood of Jesus. And so are you. You carry the blood of Jesus. So we are city gates, flesh and blood. I don't know if you realize that. We are now flesh and blood. And if you cut me open here, um, the blood that flows through my vein is Jesus. If we cut you open, the blood is Jesus Christ. Because it, with his blood... He purchased for God a people from every tribe, language, and nation, which means you all have the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Amen? And if that's the case, we are flesh and blood. And let me say this, uh, we need to have a flesh and blood attitude in this place. We are a family together. We're not just a bunch of people who rock up on a Sunday because we love worship or the Word. And stuff. We are flesh and blood. Let me tell you, the one community that's going to last to eternity, there's only one community. Do you know that, what that is? It's the church. My family, I love my family. They were sitting here. They know I love them so much. I love my wife. I love my, my two boys. Hey, that's beautiful. But all these things are temporal. There's only one that's, that's going to be lost to eternity. And it's flesh and blood here. Why? Because we carry Jesus. This family is going to go beyond Hey, flesh and blood. Flesh and let's have that attitude. Let's have that attitude towards one another. We are building, God is building a family here, which means what we are doing here is very significant. The church is the home for those who believe. And uh, as, as we've just heard, it is in the home where things get sorted out and not outside. And so God wants to sort us out. No, we are a family together. And, uh, and today as we speak, um, it's our first Sunday meeting uh, with our church plant in Uganda. And isn't that amazing? Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I was talking to Pete about some of the battles they've had to go through and to encounter um, throughout this mission trip. I mean, it was massive. And I said, please pray for us. We, just, we don't just have a team that we send to Uganda. We have flesh and blood family members who are in Uganda. And that needs to shape the way we pray for the guys who are out there. Because their battles are our battles. Their victory is our victory. And we need to own them in prayer. And we need to celebrate that today the enemy has been pushed back. And the church will arise. More family members in Uganda because the church has been planted over there. We are flesh and blood. And the flesh and blood means also flesh and blood approach to everything that we do. Everything that we do. Maybe you are carrying a ministry here at City Gates. You are leading something and you are in charge of something in this, in this place. Let me tell you this. Do it with the flesh and blood approach where relationship comes before duty. Okay? Because if duty comes before relationship, you could easily hurt others. You know that, right? And, and, and I, when I say this, that duty or ministry without relationship can become sometimes very legalistic. But relationship with ministry together is just beautiful. And by the way, ministry, sorry, relationship without uh, military campaign, as we saw here, also can be a bit sentimental sometimes. We gather together and we look at each other and say, why are we here? And it's interesting here what they say, that they gathered, they say, we are your flesh and blood. In times past, it was you who led us on a military campaign. The church is not just a people. We are a family together. But the church is not just a family together, although that's very, very important. We are a family on a mission. Amen? Because that's what God has called us to do. So we have this together in tandem. We shouldn't play one against the other. Let's be on a mission. And let's remember our brothers and sisters in Uganda. Because when they come back next Sunday and they share the story, and Pete and what he's been doing, share the story of what God has done there, we need to celebrate together. Almost as though we were there. 
it's amazing how, what Paul says, isn't it? Paul, he talks about the churches, he says, although I'm not with you in, in, in flesh, I'm with you in the spirit. And let's be with them in the spirit. Let's pray for them. Let's really, I mean, there's going to be a few mission trips this year. And it doesn't matter where you go. I want you to know that City Gates is with you. Let's be flesh and blood. Let's have this flesh and blood attitude. Let's build a family together. Let's be real. Let's be true. Let's just reflect Jesus. Hey, we have the one who has pumped his blood through our veins. We are a family together on a mission. Amen? And then he says, in the, in, in the, in the past, in times past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, David, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. And that's an interesting language that's been used there. It's so easy to take this passage and to maybe reflect on the coming together of City Hill and Gateway and say we were t two tribes. And then God has brought us together. We are one tribe. But actually, um, and, and we have been led on a military campaign. Actually, let me just say this. Pete and myself, we are not the ones leading you on a military campaign. There is a true military campaign leader who is leading you and is leading me. Do you know whose name? Jesus. And by the way, the story of the Bible, we can so easily sometimes look at the story of the Bible and make it so much about us. But the Bible is about Jesus. If you want to read the Bible well, make it about Jesus and it will make so much sense. Because the Old Testament says he is coming. And the New Testament says he has come. Which means the Old Testament, all the scriptures live with this anticipation that the Messiah is going to come. And all of a sudden, through his life, incarnation, life, death, and resurrection, suddenly the king has come. He has won the victory. And then we live with this reality of what Jesus has done. Which means when we read the story of David, we got to look at him as a type of Christ. Which means if David leads the, the 12 tribes on a military campaign, we have Jesus who is leading the church on a military campaign. Amen? We got to understand that. Because otherwise what happens is that we have this sort of way of thinking about God. So maybe let's approach this scripture. Let's look at it. We, the way we fight our battles, we can think this, is that... Maybe we got to come up with three things on how to win battles. Three things. What are they? Maybe prayer, maybe fasting, maybe something else. If we can do these three things, we'll win the battle. Let me tell you, that's not true. That's not how you win the battle. Okay? Ooh. You thought that, didn't you? Okay. Because that works. If I do these things, I'll win the battle. That's not what the Bible says. Or you can say 10 things on how to defeat the enemy. You don't defeat the enemy with 10 things. You end up with self-help gospel. If I can, I can do these things, and you know, if I self do these things, I'll defeat the enemy. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says there is the one, the military campaign leader, who has won and will win every battle. We got to lean on him. And only when you lean on him would you fight the battles. You know, you remember the story of David and Goliath? That's very much the, the, what, what we are doing. Because the whole, not the whole nation fought the battle. There was a, one representative who fought the battle. Who was that? David. And he defeated Goliath. And the victory of David became the people's victory. Which means Jesus' victory is our victory. Which means he's the one, single-handedly, who will win the battle. And we lean on Jesus, and only then would we win the battles. Amen? So remember that. You've got your list now about winning battles. Let me say this. It is Jesus who wins the battle. And I feel sometimes it can be arrogant, feeling we can do it without God. And maybe we can have that passage and say, I can do all things through the list of three things that are, no. I can do all things through Christ. He's our military campaign leader. And let's turn to Revelation 19 and see how he wins the battle. <laughs> I mean, this is fantastic. 
Look at this. This is what it says. Verse 11. It says, then I saw heaven open. I don't know if, about you, but every time heaven opens, we see someone. Every time. Whether it's Ezekiel by the river Keba, he saw heaven open, and there was the Son of Man. Or whether it's Isaiah, there was the one who is enthroned on high. Whether it was um, the, you know, Stephen, when he was stoned, and he saw heaven open. Who was standing there, standing uh, to receive him? Jesus. Every time we speak of open heaven, we want to see the image of Jesus more and more. And uh, if we talk, do you want the open heaven here? And more and more, the image of Jesus is going to grow and grow before your eyes. And this is it. They saw heaven open. And behold, this is John, a white horse. Who's on the white horse? The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Who is this guy? He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. Um, and the armies of heaven are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. We're following him. I wonder what we want to follow. Maybe our own thing. But heaven follows him on a white horse. Oh, sorry, on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He's the one who strikes them down, not us. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the one press of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, by the way, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who's that mighty military campaign leader? His name is Jesus. I mean, I love the image here. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine this. The military campaign leader, Jesus Christ. What we are picking up here is that he's the rider of the horse. Imagine you saw this rider. Who would want to stand before him? With, fla with eyes flashing of fire. Out of his mouth is a sword. And by the way, he goes by quite a few names that are, mission um, are mentioned here. And uh, here are the names. Faithful and true. He is faithful and true in your battles. You know that? If you lean on him... He's faithful and true in our battles. And then he goes for another name. It's called the word of God. He is the true word of God. And he goes by another name. This is the coolest name, by the way. His name is, nobody knows his name. He has a secret name that he goes by that only he does. Imagine you gave yourself a name, but nobody knew the name. Now, now this, is, this is because if he reveals this name, who he is. Is mind shattering. And then he goes by another name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do we know him? Do you still want to fight your own battles? By the way, he wears crowns, not one, he wears these diadems, these crowns. I'm sure in every kingdom on earth, under the earth, in heaven, he's gained a crown as the king of that place. That's why he has multiple crowns. Whether it's the kingdom of this world, he has a crown over his head that says that's his. Whether it's the kingdom of, of darkness, he reigns over there. Whether it's the kingdom in, in, in heaven, he reigns over there. He has multiple crowns. He is the king of every kingdom on earth. Do you want to be the one that's kind of stands in, stand in his way? No. And then he has these this angels on white horses. They're wearing white clothes. If you go in, into battle, you don't wear white clothes. Only he has blood on him. Why? Because these guys are wearing white clothes. They, they're probably kind of riding. I'm oh, sorry, don't repeat this. It's not theologically correct. I'm just kind of reenacting it. But they're probably riding and saying, who is this that we are following? And one angel says, he's called faithful and true. 
And the other one said, who is this that we are following? And he's called, he's called the word of God. And, uh, and the other one is, who is this that we are following? And he said, he goes by name, but only he knows. Who is this that we are following? Oh, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And then they are following him. But actually, as they are following him, by the way, they are wearing these white clothes simply because they are not leading him. They are not ahead of him. They are behind him. Only he has the blood because only he fights the battle. And only he wins the battle. And he will win every battle. The army of heaven do doesn't have to fight. We don't have to fight. Jesus fights. And Jesus will win every battle on our behalf forever. That's why we have this. Can we, let, can we let him lead us? Can we lean on him? I love that passage in Song of Solomon in, in chapter 8, verse 5. It speaks of this bride coming out of the desert of the wilderness. And the writer is looking and says, look, who is this coming out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Who is that? Who is the beloved? Jesus Christ. Guys, the church has been battered even as we just heard. Secrets and many things. We are a people with, with broken background and, you know, secrets and stuff that's happened. Let me tell you that we can't sort it out on our own. Let's lean on him. And sometimes the way we lean is this. You know, I, we, I'm leaning on Jesus. I'm touching his cloak. It says if I t touch the hem of his cloak, I'll be healed. But actually, yeah, but I, I think my job will be the answer to everything. Um, but I'm leaning, I'm leaning. And, uh, but I think if I do these five things, I'll be okay. Uh, but I'm still leaning, you yeah? know. But you're leaning this way. And you're trying to touch Jesus. Now, the Bible says you need to lean this way. And lean towards him. And, lean, and when you lean, you are a bit off balance. You don't try to sort your life out in that way. You let him sort you out. And let's, let's allow Jesus to sort us out. And by the way, he is, he is amazing. He'll sort us out. He's the one who will lead us in this triumphal procession for his namesake. And all the armies of the earth will be defeated because of Jesus. So whatever problem we have, let's bring it to him. We were talking about laying our, cr our crowns today at the feet of Jesus. Let's lay our everything at the feet of Jesus. And not try to sort it out on our own. And when all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them and at Hebron. Um, I think this is an interesting one about a covenant. Um, because, the reason I'm saying that is because, I don't know if you know how covenants were made before. I mean, this passage talks about covenant. Maybe your Bible says a treaty. Maybe it says a pact. Maybe it says a, an agreement. But, you know, we can use them interchangeably. That's okay. So they made a pact with David, and they said, David, we are your flesh and blood, and they made a covenant. I mean, covenants in the, in the Old Testament were like real stuff. What do I mean by that? What they will do is they will take an animal, and they will cut it in half. Okay, and they put one side this side, and one side this side. And you walk through this animal in between. And basically what you say is, Lord... If I ever break this covenant, do unto me <laughs> as you did unto the animal. <gasps> That's big stuff, isn't it? But actually, let's take the covenant seriously. We made a covenant with Jesus when we say we follow him, which means we are with him. We are caught up in him. And this covenant means a covenant between us and God and a covenant between one another. So where, wherever you are in this place right now this afternoon you are in covenant with one another I don't know if you realize that you, you have a covenant together turn to the person next to you and say we are in a covenant together <laughs> oh some of you some of you said it to your spouse <laughs> and I love it as long as it's not the first time I'm joking. So we are in this covenant together. And let me say, why am I saying that? Because for the church, a lot of the time, we've created this, even as we've just heard, we've created this kind of lifestyle where it's all nice and polished. Um, we have, we come here when we are happy and life is going well, we sing, we shout. And then all of a sudden, when we have problems, we disappear. And almost like, you know, there's no one else who's going to help me. I'm isolated. I'm on my own. I can do this and all the rest of it. Let me say this. If that's what the church is, 
is a place just to show face and, uh, you know, to save face and all that. It's not a church. Let's be real. Let's be open. I remember going through a really hard time in 2011. I, was, I hit rock bottom at the time, and, uh, and I was sitting in my house with tears running down my, uh, my, you know, my cheeks all the time. And, and at the time, I just felt like, this is it, I'm done, I'm finished. And uh, one brother who uh, comes here quite often, his name is Rodney, we were, the sa- we, were el- we were in the same eldership together, and I said, I'm done, I'm not doing it, I'm just, I'm Lord, I'm out. And uh, he came to me, and he was spent almost every day and sit with me and encourage me and comfort me and spend time with me and just kind of, and, uh, but somehow I was wallowing in despair and just living in that and, uh, and we talked, we talked, we talked. And there came a moment where he said, he said, Chrissy, let me just say this. I've been where you are. So what do you mean? He said, let me tell you my story. He said, I sat, uh, stood in in a car park of the church before I was to go into a meeting one time. And he said, I wept before I could even open the door. And he said, uh, because there was so much that was happening in my life at the time, he said, I was weeping and weeping in the car. And I was saying, what you're saying now, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Take it away. You know, I can't be in ministry. I can't do A, B, C, D. You know, I, was in, I had re- hit, hit rock bottom, depression, you name it. That's where I was. And uh, he, he said to me, he said, um, you know what? God really came and encountered me in that moment. God spoke to me about forgiveness. And he said, uh, I came out of the car. I went into the service. I went to the, the, the guy who was leading the church and uh, who didn't know anything about how I was feeling at, the, at that time. And I said to him, I said, uh, look, for all this time, um, I felt belittled by you. And, um, but I didn't tell you. So this has been eating me on the inside this whole time. And he said, um, he said I, God said to me in the car over there when I was cry, crying in tears, God said to me, I must go to you and say and ask you to forgive me. And I want to say to you today, for all the things that have happened, I forgive you. And this guy was like, I didn't even know this. And they hugged and, you know, it was just such a moment of joy and he was free. And at that moment, he spoke over my life. And then he said to me, Chrissy, God has called you into so much. I've been sitting and listening to everything you've said. And I believe, but I'm going to pray today that God will set you free. He prayed and I rose from that day. And that's why I'm here today. And let me tell you what, and, and let me tell you what, let me tell you this. It's easy for me to just sit over there and sort it out. I never would have done it. It was, I'm in covenant with Rodney and we sort things out. And uh, who, are, who are you in covenant with? Who are the people you are able to talk to? Are we just going to kind of hide it, sort it out here, and come back? No. Flesh and blood. Let's do it here. Let the church be a place of just openness, freedom, where healing happens, where we cry a lot, where, you know, I would love to see the ministry of tears in this place. Let's just be. Let's just be. Let's be real. We're in the covenant together. We are compacted together. We've made a pact with our Savior and with one another. Let's not be isolated. Amen? Amen. And then, obviously, he, he started to reign for, you know, from the age when he was 30. And uh, we know the one who, who, who started his ministry at 30. I wouldn't go into that. But actually, the king, it says, the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites. Um, I'm going to get you to march in a minute. Just get ready. Um, who lived there? The Jebusite said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame will ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. I don't know about you. Maybe, but we are bombarded daily by these Jebusite voices in our lives. You will never, you will never, you will never. So sometimes the Jebusite voice will say um, things like, you will never deal with your addiction. You will never have a happy marriage. You will never have children. Nobody likes you. Why bother? You are not good enough. You will never, you will never, you will never, you will never overcome. You will never do A, B, C, D. How many of us have been lied to daily? It's a battle of the mind by this Jebusite voice. 
and we live in that and we, have, we, we receive that and we, and we, have, we sink into that lie of the enemy. Like in the Garden of Eden, Eve, listen to the Shebusad voice. Or, hey, come on, if you do this, you'll be like God. Before we know it, they'd blown it. Later, we know that Judas, hey, if you do this, they get lots of money. Come on, just tell us who he is and take this money. Jebusite voice. Let me say this. Let's not listen to the Jebusite voice. The Jebusite were mocking David. They were mocking the people of God. They said, even the lame and the blind will ward you off. You will never get in here. And the Bible says, nevertheless, David took the stronghold. Never. Nevertheless, the enemy says never, and we say nevertheless. It say, the enemy will come to you and say, you'll never have a, a happy life. That's why we love that hymn that's, that speaks of uh, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me all of the guilt within. Never. You have guilt. And then what does he say? What's the next verse? Upward, I look and see him there. Who is that? Jesus Christ. And he's the one who takes away my sin. Nevertheless, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. And the enemy has said, the Jebusite has said, you will never enter. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold and established it and became the city of David. Have you got battles? Is the enemy saying never? We gotta know how to say nevertheless. And the way that we do that is that we always march forward. We march forward to take ground for Jesus in our lives. And that's why I'm saying we're gonna march in a moment. Can I get the band to come forward, please? And um, so, what I'm, I wanna ask you is you know, the, the people of God were marching, and when we are marching, we are drowning out the Jebusite voice in our lives. Okay, this background noise that's lying over us and say we are not good, we cannot do that. We are marching as the army of God on a military campaign with our military campaign leader. We will win battles. And here are some of the enemies that sometimes the enemy puts to us. You'll never shake your guilt or, you know, shame is forever or fear will grip you forever. You'll never overcome it. Eh? You'll never overcome meaning, meaninglessness or your you don't even know your identity, and you'll never overcome it. You'll always be confused, isn't it? These are our personal enemies that Jebusite voices over our lives. And then you have other voices like injustice is never going to go away. Never. And our poverty is never going to go away. Conflict and you name it. And it's never, 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 never. And you live in this world where you've just given up. And, and also some of the, 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 the global problems we can get so overwhelmed and to a point that sometimes in our lives, it's almost like Jesus becomes smaller and the problems just become, get bigger and bigger. We were sickness, COVID. We were all thinking we are going to perish. Ugliness. And by the way, the last, de the last enemy, death. You'll never overcome. But let me tell you this. We are leading, we are, we are being led by the one who has overcome. And by the way, we will overcome. Let's stand together because we are going to march together. And when we march, we make the declaration together that we will overcome. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's march together. We are going to... It sounds funny, isn't it? Come on. I want us to remember this moment. Nevertheless, Jesus. Nevertheless, whatever it is you are faced with, nevertheless, Jesus. He is the... He's the leader of this army. He's leading us on a military campaign. We have our leader with us on a white horse. The ride of the white horse is leading us. So we're going to read this together. Nevertheless, guys, what are we saying? Come on, let's read it together. Guilt is forgiven. Let's read. Shame is removed. Come on. No, it becomes a tongue twister when you get to the, come on. Sickness has been conquered. Beauty has been restored. Death, the final. 
who has done it? Come on, let's lean on him. Come on, let's lean on him. Come on, let's march it once more. Come on. What is the voice that you are hearing in your life right now? City gates, let's march forward. Let's move forward. Let's conquer. Let's see all tribes, all nations come before Jesus. One day, we're going to be reunited with our maker, and we're going to say we have overcome because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's applaud Jesus. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how I fight. Amazing, eh? Don't forget this week who fights your battles. Okay? Always remember, go to him. Go to him. He will do it for you. So we've come to the end of today's service. But if you want to know more about what Elizabeth was talking about, at the welcome desk, there are these flyers. If you look up, there's three QR codes. The first one if you're interested in doing course with her on Zoom, just scan that code and upload your details and they'll be in touch. And they also are very available to minister. So if you would like prayer, ministry team is here. They are also here. 
please do come forward. And if you're here for the first time today and you've never been to City Gates, we'd love to meet you in the Welcome Lounge, which is just on the right before the main door. And other than that, City Gates, have a wonderful week. Press into Jesus. Love him. Be excellent in your job, in your family. Love Jesus and know who fights your battles. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Thank <laughs> you.